that you're not a sinner anymore. Go to Romans, read the whole book. But in, in Romans 3, it says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then if we go on in, in Romans, in Romans 6, it says that the wages of sin is death. So there's a big problem there, isn't there? But it goes on, it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's really good news right there. And that's what communion is all about, is that we're remembering that. There's really bad news for sinners, which we all are. But there's really good news found in Jesus Christ. And so that's what we do when we, when we do this act of communion. We need to be remembered. I want you to think about a couple of words. Remembrance and also proclamation. And, and as, we, as, you know, as I'm saying this, I want you to think about that. That's why we do communion. And we do it every week so we remember, we don't forget. You know, in 1 Corinthians 11, which is, uh, you know, the, the, the standard scripture that we always look at, isn't it? Or a lot of times. Um, I'm going to read it, just a little bit of it. And I want you to think about remembrance and proclamation. It says, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so when we do this every week, you guys, we are remembering and proclaiming that we are sinners in desperate need of a Savior. Desperate need. That's what we're remembering and we're also proclaiming. And I, I think about myself, who am I proclaiming that to? Well, we're here as a church. We're proclaiming that to each other as we do this together. But we're proclaiming it to ourselves because we have a tendency to forget how easy we forget and we start thinking we got things figured out and that we don't need a Savior anymore. And that's why we do this. We're, we proclaim and remember that God made a way that only he could have made. We couldn't do it ourselves, right? We are proclaiming and remembering right now that we are as great in need of a Savior as the day that we were first saved. And so as we take these elements, I want you to really consider that. I'm going to give you a moment of silence here, just a, a moment to reflect. If you would all just close your eyes and think about that. Remember what Christ has done for us. And proclaim that to yourself that we need saving desperately. This little wafer here on top represents Christ's body that was brutally, brutally destroyed in our place. Like I said, the wages of sin is death. Somebody had to die for our sins. Thank God it was, he did it for us. And we take that and remember to him. And in the same way, this, this juice, this little bit of juice, it represents his blood that was spilt, that was shed, that was poured out for us, for the forgiveness of our sins, that he made a way for us to have a right relationship with God. God. God, I thank you for your church. God, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here, God, that have joined me, God, in remembering and proclaiming, God, to each other and to ourselves, God, what a great sacrifice you made, God, when you were nailed to a cross, God, in our place, God. The only thing that could satisfy the wrath of God that, that you poured out on your son, God, to have a relationship with us, God, may we never forget that, Lord. God, thank you so much. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. 
my name is Abby Beck and I get to work with the Sunday school kiddos and with the middle school girls and I just want to take a moment and thank all the parents that bring their kids to Sunday school this morning my helpers were kids that I had in Sunday school preschool <laughs> so I'm just so grateful for that and um, today I would, would like to talk to you about uh, kingdom investment first of all I want to ask you guys how many have boxes like this that come to their house on a regular basis show of hands we all do right <laughs> sometimes it's how we survive especially during COVID you know it's our only way of getting things right um, have you guys ever ordered something and been disappointed in what you, re you what you invested in show of hands anybody anybody done that I don't know if you guys remember but uh, ben made this beautiful Passover meal for us. Does anybody remember that? And in it, he was going to have, you know, this big chalice that was to uh, represent the blood of Jesus. And so he brings the chalice and it ends up being this. Do you guys remember that? So obviously Ben was disappointed whenever that happened, right? Um, this week, though, I listened to a sermon by Cody McQueen in a, ch a, ch a church in Fort Worth, Texas. And he talked about um, kingdom investment and living with the end in mind. And in it, he used this scripture in Matthew verse 24. And to kind of set the context, Jesus and his disciples were walking past Herod's temple and Herod's temple was a major construction feat. Um, the stones that were used at smallest were two, ton, two to five tons, and the biggest stones that were used were up to 50 tons. Some, some places say that it's 500 tons, which Kevin wanted to challenge me on that, but I looked it up and it was there in a couple of places. <laughs> but just a huge construction feat. And so Jesus and his disciples were walking along next to Herod's temple. And it says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away with his, with his disciples when they came upon him and called his attention to the buildings. But Jesus said, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, no, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. So it got me thinking about um, what are we investing our time and our money into, and does it really matter? And God's kingdom is the only thing that really matters. The only resources we have in this life are time and our money and, our, and what God blesses us with. But it's really humbling to think this structure is not going to be standing at some point in time. Herod's temple, was, it, Herod's temple took about over 50 years to build. Do you know how many years it stood? Six. So everything of this world is temporary. The only thing that's worth investing in is our kingdom. And um, in Psalms chapter 145, verse 13, it says, Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures forever through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. And I debated on sharing this with you today, but I need to, on a personal level, share. I had one of the hardest weeks this week. And if I did not have the hope of Christ, I would be in despair today. I truly would. But praise God, because I have him in my life, and I had a church I was raised in, people who loved me, people who spoke truth into me, I'm able to be free. And I'm just so grateful for that. And we don't want the world to get this. We want the world to get his full blood. We want them to have this hope. And right now, people need that hope. So the ways that we give are we give online. Um, you can text, and you can also mail it in. Something that works for me and Kevin, because we're a little bit busy, is we also just do like an auto bill pay from the, ch from the bank to the church too. Um, that's another option. But I just don't want us to forget how important it is to sacrificially give our time and our money 
to the only kingdom that's going to stand and the only thing that matters. So if you'll pray with me, please. Dear Father, there's just no way we can thank you enough for all that you do for us. Um, we're just so humbled and so grateful that um, you care for each one of us deeply. I pray that you would use our resources and our time and our offerings only for your glory. I pray that we would steward our lives well in a way that is pleasing to you. And I just pray that you be with um, the speaker today and as they bring the message. Holy Spirit, please come into this place. Open our hearts and our minds. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. How's everyone doing today? We're good? I'm going to move this over a little bit. Um, if I sound funny, it's this... I'm, I'm still not used to this season of the year whenever it goes from like 70 degrees to 40 degrees in about five minutes and my sinuses and everything just start exploding. So if I start, you know, if my, if I start talking about like my dose is blocked, that's, that would be, that'd be why. Um, we are actually uh, hopping back into our series in the book of Exodus. So for the last couple months, um, we've taken a, a hiatus and we've been looking at um, God's forgiveness and how God forgives us, how we forgive others, uh, and, and many other aspects of forgiveness. And it's been a really good challenge, uh, and I know that so many of you um, have been encouraged, uh, challenged, um, potentially disappointed by some of the things that you've been challenged to do. Um, uh, but it's been a really fantastic couple of months um, as we've been looking at how we can interact together as a community um, and, uh, and how we can grow together. Um, this week, though, we're hopping straight back into the book of Exodus. So we've been doing this throughout the year, and we are, uh, we're, we're not too close to the end, but we've only got a couple months left. Uh, there's still a lot going on in this book. Um, but for those of you who don't know me, if you're, if you're new here, I'm the youth pastor here. My name's Thomas. I am not from Kentucky. Uh, and if you, can, if you struggle to follow, I apologize, but I will do my best to slow down, is what I get told quite frequently. So I'll do my best. Um, Today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 20. So if you have uh, a Bible with you, uh, open it up to Exodus 20. If you do not, there should be one in front of you, so go ahead and grab it. I'd really encourage you to follow along. Uh, we're going to be reading from the NIV translation today. I think most of the ones in the pews are in, in the NIV. And we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 20. Now, if you know Exodus uh, and, you, and you sort of know this passage, this should be very familiar. And um, we're looking at the Ten Commandments in this passage. Um, so Exodus chapter 20, and we'll start at verse 1. And I'm going to pause a couple of times um, just to sort of clarify a couple of things as we go through it. So, Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke all these words. So let's pause right there. Okay, so we're going to stop here. We're going to analyze something real quick. Uh, something we say with our youth quite a lot, and I know it's been said up here, is that whenever you see a phrase like, and so, or like the word therefore, that's kind of like the classic one, is when you see the word therefore, you have to ask, what's it there for? Right? So, Something is happening here. It says, and God spoke all these words. What's going on? Right? So we, we have to remember, we've got to look back. And it's been a couple of months since we've looked in the book of Exodus. So last time that Ben spoke on Exodus, we were in chapter 19. And at this point in the story, all of the Israelites had made their way out of Egypt. And all of the miraculous signs had happened. All of this stuff had gone on. And, and God brought them out of Egypt and through to the wilderness. And, and they're at a point now where they go up. And um, they're all supposed to go up to this place called Mount Sinai because God wants them to be in his presence. And this is a big theme that we're going to start seeing unfold throughout the rest of this book, that God wants uh, his people to be in his presence. But the people don't go, right? And they send Moses instead because it says in chapter 19 that God descends on the mountain uh, and, and it's kind of crazy. There's like a thunderstorm and smoke and fire and everything going on on this mountain. And Moses is like, hey, we're all supposed to go up there. <laughs> and people are like, good, we'll see you later. <laughs> so they don't go up, but Moses goes up on his own. Uh, so Moses is up there. And at this point, God gives him the Ten Commandments. So we'll continue. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself any or an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to worship uh, to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, 
punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that was in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Verse 12, honor your mother and father so that you may live long in the land the Lord has given you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Uh, pray with me. Father, thank you for your word. Um, it is a powerful and amazing um, uh, book and set of books. Lord, we are so blessed to have it, and I pray that um, you inspire us through it today. In your name we pray. Amen. So we've heard these passages loads and loads of times, right? We, we've, we've been brought up being taught the Ten Commandments, and it's something that we hear a lot. Um, and I, I, I would love to spend... Um, I mean, we could spend 10 weeks going through uh, all the Ten Commandments, and there's so many little details that uh, we're not going to have time to get into today about the Ten Commandments, but uh, we actually do have a podcast online where we talk a little bit more about extra things about this passage, so this little plug there. So if you want to check that out throughout the week on YouTube, um, we, we sort of do a deep dive into the passage and talk about more than we could talk about on Sunday mornings. So I'm not going to go into every little detail um, about each of the, the Ten Commandments, but I want to ask three basic questions. And these are three basic questions that are really good to ask any time you approach Scripture, um, especially Old Testament. So first question, what are the Ten Commandments? Like, what are they? What's the purpose of them? I mean, is, is it just ten rules that, you know, if you, don't, if you don't keep them, you'll get a little slap on the back of the wrist and you go on about your day? Um, and that's, this is something that we always have to ask. What is it that this passage is actually trying to tell us? Uh, interestingly enough, some people argue that there are actually 11. Uh, this is kind of something that I discovered while studying for this, that there are 11 commandments. The, there's a, some belief system that would say that verse 2 is actually one of the commandments. It says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Um, I'm, we're not really going to get into that. I just thought it's interesting that some people say that we should hold that to as high a standard to remember the things that God has done for us and who he is, is a commandment in and of itself. Um, but we'll, we'll keep moving on from that one. Um, the, the Ten Commandments um, often is described like a heavenly contract. That's something that we might hear quite frequently, right? The, the, the Ten Commandments are like a contract. But again, if we keep this context of this theme that we're beginning to see unfold throughout uh, the book of Exodus, God wants us to dwell in his presence. You see, God is our God that we worship, the God that we, we got introduced to back in chapter 3, um, whose name is Yahweh, meaning the sovereign, perfect, all-powerful God. He is not in the business of us um, worshiping Him from afar, being scared for our lives, and sacrificing our children to Him, or any sort of crazy stuff like that. No, He wants a personal relationship. He wants us to dwell in His presence. Another thing that we see frequently throughout the Old Testament is that the idea that the idea for all of God's people was that we were all supposed to be priests. That's why Jesus takes that a step further in Paul as well, is that we are a royal priesthood. And again, in chapter 19, all people were supposed to go up and be in God's presence. Instead, it ended up um, being Moses. And the priests went a certain way up the, the mountain, uh, and, and uh, you know, they didn't quite get there. But this theme of being in God's presence is, is forming. And we can't remove that from this heavenly contract that we hear about quite a lot, right? You see, the contract or this, this, these sets of rules is not just a set of do's and don'ts. But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of saying, hey, I want you to be in my presence. I'm, I'm going to be your God and you will be my people. 
Do these things and it will please me. If, if you want to be in my presence, here's some things that I need you to do. Here's some guidelines and some rules because God is a jealous God. He is king and he is not about sharing um, his status with anybody, but he does want us to be close and he has given us authority over this earth, but he doesn't just leave us alone to do it. He gives us 10 rules or 10 guidelines on, on ways that we can do that. So we have these 10 commandments. Uh, in Exodus chapter 6, it says, I will be, or I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out, of, uh, out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. If Yahweh is to be our God, this is what he expects. And again, this is written to people in the, in the Old Testament, right, to the Jews. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But this was the expectation for the Israelites back in this day. I am going to be your God, says Yahweh. You will be my people. I will bless you abundantly. You will follow what I ask. This is the contract. And it's a pretty good contract because the people of Israel um, have been grumbling and complaining and being a bit of a nuisance throughout the entire two books of the Bible so far and probably for the rest of the books in the front, right to the very end. But God says, I'm going to be your God. Even though you've messed up so many times before, here's 10 things I want you to follow. And I, I, I want you to do this because it pleases me. I want you to be in my presence. So follow these rules uh, and, and, and these commandments because it is good for you and it's good for me. So the, the, this these Ten Commandments are like a heavenly contract designed to help us bring us into God's presence. Second question, who are they for? This is a big thing that we find a lot of times throughout Scripture, and it's a big hot topic today, especially um, for a lot of young people. Whenever we read laws in the Old Testament, so many people will come up and say, oh, well, those are laws written for different people of a different time. We don't really need to pay attention to those. And that comes up a lot, especially in sort of political debates um, or, or uh, sort of uh, moral debates on, on things that are popular to debate at the moment, is they'll say, well, you know, it, you know, yeah, it says that, but it also says you shouldn't shave your beard into a point or that you shouldn't mix your fabrics. So, well, if you're going to discard those, you may as well discard all of them. And that's a big question, right? Because we, do, we are allowed to shave our beards into a point and we do mix our fabrics. So, so why, why are some of these laws in the Old Testament left behind and others we continue to follow today? And are the Ten Commandments some of those? Which ones are they? Are we supposed to leave those behind or do we keep following them? And I don't have the answer to all of those. I can't really tell you which ones you're supposed to follow and which ones you're not. Um, but a really good way of looking at it um, is that there are moral laws and that we are called to follow. And the Ten Commandments are the, the basis for those. And there's many more that flow out of that. And then there are other things that I'm going to call cultural laws. And that hasn't really changed, right? Because the Egyptians or the Israelites, after they left Egypt, they go into the promised land. But there's loads of other nations there. There's the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and all these names that I can't remember all of them. Um, but they all have these really weird practices. Some of them sacrificed babies to their gods. Some of them mixed their fabrics. Others shaved their beards into a point. And God was saying... Uh, in a lot of these other laws that people discard these days by saying, I don't want you to be like the other people in your land. And that has not changed. We get told all the time in the New Testament, do not conform to the patterns of this world. We're not supposed to look like everyone else in this country. We're to live differently because that pleases God and that brings us into his presence. We're called to live a different lifestyle. We're not called to fit in we're called to stand out and be a little bit weird. <laughs> Some of you are very good at that. But no, and the, like there's, we're challenged to live a different lifestyle and to, to not just conform to the patterns of this world. For people in ancient Israel, that might have been to do with their clothing, shaving their beards into points, not eating shellfish, etc. Um, so there are those sort of cultural things where we are called to stand out and be different. But there are also moral laws where God says these are absolutes. Murder, adultery, all of these ones. Those are the two that often come to our minds because they're the easiest ones to remember. Um, 
and I, I, we're going to get to this in a second, but these, I do think these are written in, a, in an order for a certain reason. Uh, so some of these we think are really serious. Murder, adultery, um, w stealing, right? We're good with those. But before murder comes honoring your father and mother. Now, I'm the youth pastor, so I get to say this to all the kids. Pay attention to that. Um, please do. It's good for you, it's good for your parents, and it's honoring to God. Even when you don't want to, honoring your father and your mother is so important. Whether you're a teenager or an adult, um, it is something that we're called to do. And I, I'm a hypocrite in saying that because my teenagehood was abysmal, <laughs> and I was horrible to my parents. Also, happy birthday, mom, if she's watching. Um, but I was not a good son to my parents. I did not honor my mother and father. Uh, and it caused so many problems to not just me, to my sisters and to my parents. And there's a very good reason that we're called to honor our parents. There's a very good reason we're called not to murder. There's a very good reason we're called not to commit adultery. These things please God whenever we abstain from these things. Um, so who are they for? They're for all of us. And the reason I can say that they are for all of us is because oftentimes when we look at the Old Testament, we kind of push it to the side, right? But then we're like, I'm just going to stick with the New Testament because it's easier. I do that a lot because I, anytime I'm, I'm asked to do a Bible study, I'm like, let's go to Paul, right? Because he just says, basically all of Paul's letters start the same way or they're all written the same way. It's like, you know, it's, it's great to hear from you. I, we love you. You guys are awesome. Here's areas where you're messing up and Timothy says hello. That's kind of how he structures all of his letters. And they're easy. They're kind of, I mean, they're challenging, but they're easy to read. And I've been challenging myself a lot more in this last little while to read through the Old Testament and dive into it. Um, and it's amazing, and we're looking at this with our youth, the amount of things that point to Jesus. Almost every page in the Bible points towards Jesus. And here's the thing that Jesus has to say about the Ten Commandments, is that he affirms all of them. All of them. We can't leave these by the wayside because this is not, no longer just for ancient Israelites because Jesus says, you have to do it too. In fact, Jesus takes it a step even farther, right? So in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus takes the Ten Commandments, uh, things like murder and adultery, and he takes those and he puts them far more strictly than, than physical murder or physical adultery. He says, if you hate your brother or sister, you've murdered them in your heart. Something we've been looking at with forgiveness. Withholding forgiveness and holding malice and hatred towards our, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ, is violating these Ten Commandments, according to Jesus. Even looking at someone lustfully and inappropriately, according to Jesus, is violating this contract and breaking us away from the presence of God. Just looking at someone inappropriately and letting that movie play in your mind, and letting it go, is violating these Ten Commandments. I mean, you might say, Thomas, I haven't actually, like, I've never ha had an affair, I haven't slept with anyone outside of my marriage. Can you honestly say that you've never looked at someone for just a little bit too long than you were supposed to and let that movie play? We all mess up in all of these areas. I don't know if you've stolen things. I don't know where you're at in your life or what, what other things you struggle with. But here's the thing that is very clear in the Bible. If you mess up one, you've messed up all of them. If, if for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God... Matthew 22, verse 36 uh, through 40, Jesus sums up all of these Ten Commandments into two. Uh, and I, I don't really have time to get into it, but it's fascinating when you read through them again. The first four or five are all about one thing, and the remaining five or six are all about the second thing that Jesus is about to talk about. Matthew 22, uh, verse 36 to 40, Jesus says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the greatest commandment? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. He takes all of the commands. In fact, he takes the entire Old Testament and says everything sums up to this, these two statements. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind and love your neighbor um, as yourself. We're, we're called to love God above everything. 
And frequently, we actually focus more on the second commandment than we do on the first, right? We do a lot of talking about how we can love our neighbors, right? And, and that's a good challenge. But that's, according to Jesus, that's the second commandment. The first commandment, and the most important, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And he sums up everything into these two things. You see, these ten commandments that we focus on are, were designed and written to people in ancient Israel to bring them closer to the presence of Yahweh. And that has not changed from then to today. The, the, the commandments of the, of the Old Testament, like these ten, are designed to bring us closer to God because this is what He wants. Now, if you're in a relationship or if you're, if you're married or if you have siblings or friends or whatever, you want to do what those other people want, right? I want to please my wife. I want to bring her flowers and I want to um, come home and hang out for lunch rather than just sit in here. Or I want to spend time with her because that is something that she values. It's something that's special to her and I know that it's something that she loves. And if I love her, I will do those things, right? This isn't some authoritative you know, uh, like, uh, what's the word I'm trying to look for? I don't know. Uh, it's gone. But this isn't some, like, thing where we have this big angry God and he's saying, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you. I mean, it, it's, it sort of says that, but we'll get to that later. But the, the, um, the, the reason that he says these things is because he loves us so much and he wants us to love him back. He doesn't force us to love him. He doesn't force that upon us. He wants us to desperately. And if you love someone, you do what pleases them because that not only brings them joy, but it brings you joy as well. That's what the purpose of these Ten Commandments are all about. It's not some strict rules that we're just to, that God just picked out of a hat. No, these are things that He loves. He loves justice. He loves purity and honesty. He loves life. That's why He tells us not to take it. He loves these things, and if we love Him, we should do them for Him, because that brings Him joy, and it brings us joy. Now, lastly, um, how well are we doing with these? How, how, how are you getting on with, with these 10? Just 10, right? Because, again, in the Old Testament, there's like 600 and something do's and don'ts. In the New Testament, there's over 1,000. How are you doing with these 10? In fact, when Jesus sums them up into two, how are you doing with the first one? Let's read the first uh, commandment again. You shall have no other gods before me. How are you doing with that one? And Chad kind of alluded to this already, but we don't do very well, right? We have so many things that we put first because we've gotten so numb to the fact that we worship an almighty, powerful God who is the king of the universe and is also our father. We get numb to that. That's the most ridiculous and crazy news ever. The fact that the, the, the person who designed the tree wants to have a relationship with you. If I got to meet Thomas Edison, who created a light bulb, I'd be, you know, pretty stoked. That'd be pretty cool. But, but I get to have a conversation with the one who designed the universe anytime I want. Got him on speed dial. Yet I never talked to him. Right? And, and Chad alluded to this earlier. Like, the things that we speak loudest about and the things that we get most animated about tells other people what we're most passionate about. If you get louder at sports games than you do for Jesus, you got a problem. If you get more animated at a, like a, a, a concert event, a musical festival, than you do worshiping the Lord in your car on the way to work, you got a problem. If you care more about your job because it provides for your family than you do about Jesus, you got a problem. Those are good things, but they're bad things if you put them first. And, and, and there are so many things, the list is endless that we put before God. All of us do it. I do it all the time. I, I'll put Kylie before God, I'll put our house before God, I'll put my job before God, which is a really weird thing to do when you're in ministry, but it's so easy to do. Like, my job is to tell you about Jesus. Like, literally, that's what I'm paid to do, and that's a real problem sometimes, because I do it because I have to, and I get a paycheck for it. 
I'll study the Bible throughout the week. Like the, tonight, we're talking about David and Goliath, and we're, we're doing a big, deep dive into it. And I'll spend a lot of time diving into Exodus or diving into the story of David and Goliath, not because I care about the stories, but because I have to teach it. A lot of times, that's where my mind is at. And that's awful. Even ministry can become an idol. And it can be really difficult. And the, the two years that we lived in Lexington um, were the first two years of my adult life that I wasn't working in ministry and I was entirely voluntary, and it completely changed my faith, flipped the whole thing upside down. Because for years when I was in Ireland, I was telling people in the church every day, go out, share your faith, and go tell people about Jesus. And I've, I've said this before, then I got to Lexington, and I started working in a coffee shop, and I didn't work for a church, and I realized, oh, I've got the nine to five, and I have to go tell people about Jesus now. And it made my faith so much more real, because I realized for the longest time, it can be really easy to fall into in our job of, well, we do this because that's the expectation of the job. Maybe you're a teacher. You teach because it's the expectation of your job. You, you're a plumber. You're an electrician. You're, you're a doctor, a nurse, uh, whatever it might be. We have expectations in our job and those jobs, and those are good things. And it doesn't matter what the job is. If we put that before our relationship with God, we've messed it up, even in ministry especially in ministry sometimes, because we can just become so numb to the idea. You see, God is desperately wants to be first. He's a jealous God. He doesn't want anyone else first. And he, he has every right to do that because he is the king of all kings. He has every right to be jealous because no one else is actually deserving to be above him. Yet we put everything in our lives above him. Ben has said this before, but I've never had to consciously worship something else, right? I've never had to put in effort to put something above God. It just happens. It's just built into my DNA. Yet I, we do have to consciously make the effort to put God first. Being a Christian and, and, and putting God first and following Yahweh is not um, a side thing. Following Jesus is not a little pin that you put on your shirt. In fact, one thing that I've, I've said a few times is that I think the idea of accepting Jesus is really dangerous. Because accepting, if I say I'm going to accept Jesus, that makes it sound like I take Jesus and I pin him onto my shirt and I continue about my day. We need to change our language and say that I'm not accepting Jesus, I'm giving everything that I am over to Jesus. I'm not accepting Jesus, I'm surrendering my entire life to Jesus and I'm putting him first. And we fail at that every day, all day, in everything. Now, here's the thing. If the Bible ended at Malachi, I would have invited the worship team to come up and I would have ended the sermon there. It doesn't. And the story continues. You see, if the Ten Commandments are the only way to heaven, and us living perfectly are the only way to heaven, there's no point in us being here. We've already failed. We've already messed up. But the Bible doesn't end at Malachi. It continues. And God knew that this, the law of the Old Testament was not going to cut it. He, the law was designed to show us that we cannot do it ourselves. But there's one who can. And his name is Jesus. Jesus came and he fulfilled every single one of these. He never looked at somebody inappropriately. He never let that movie play. He never had hatred towards anyone. Anyone. Didn't matter if they disagreed with his political views. He never hated anyone. Because that would have been murder in his heart. There was not a single moment in his life when God was not first. He never took anything that wasn't his. He always respected his father and mother. Like we watched The Chosen this morning. And he honored his mother by changing the time that he was going to reveal himself to the world. I mean, I don't know if that's theologically correct to say it like that, but I'm going to say it because that kind of seems the way that it looks. He honors his father and mother because that's correct, and he revealed himself to the world because that's correct. He did all the things that you and I fail at every single day so that we can be free for eternity. I'm going to say that again. We can be free for eternity, right? The, the Bible tells us over and over again, like all the New Testament is about how that we are no longer condemned. There is like all of these laws that we were bound by, we are free. 
coming to America, and I've, I've come to recognize that that word freedom is a very big word here, and people love it. Here's the thing. This book and that guy Jesus provides more freedom than America ever could. Ever. Again, we have like 80 years here, and we can have fun with it, and it's great, and we can do good things, and, and all this stuff's good, but we have an eternity, literal eternity in perfection with Jesus awaiting us, or we don't. And this is the part where you have to choose. Are you going to say, I'm a pretty good person? I think I live up to those standards. I'm, I'm pretty good, right? By human standards, I'm pretty good. So I'm probably fine. Don't worry about me. You're going to choose that? Or you're going to recognize that the standard is not human standard and the standard is God's standard and that you fall woefully short, but that Jesus didn't. And that is such amazing news. Uh, I'm going to invite the worship team if they'll come up as, as we close here. But the, the good news today is that all of these laws, as much as it, it, it reveals our sin to us so frequently, and that can really get us down, right? Because it's not fun stuff to recognize that you're messed up. Uh, and as, as I said earlier, Ben does a good job of reminding us every week that we're sinners. That's part of his job. <laughs> That's what we do here. But it's never removed from the gospel. Because even though you and I are messed up, the possibility for an eternity of perfection has been offered to you and to me. And the question is, are you going to accept that? It's an open offer, and anyone can accept it. Are you going to dedicate your life to Jesus? and give everything that you are over to him and put him first? Or are you going to keep yourself first? It's up to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you that you gave your life for us. Lord, we take that so lightly because we hear it every single week. But Lord, you are a, a wonderful and amazing father. Thank you for everything you've done. And Lord, I pray that if anybody in this room has come to the realization that they're not putting you first, I pray that you challenge them to do so because it pleases you and it'll also please them. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would, let's all stand together. in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I prove him over Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me. Neat the healing, cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Jesus, 
Precious Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust the precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that Thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him all and all. Jesus, Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Amen. You may be seated for a moment. All right. Uh, Thomas, first off, thank you for that, my friend. Thank you so much for that word. Uh, a couple of announcements, and then we'll pray and be dismissed this morning. I want to remind you that the uh, youth group, kids ministry, meeting here at 6 p.m. this evening over in the Life Center. I uh, also want to remind you that on October 14th, uh, Fostering Possibilities, uh, which is a nonprofit group here in Grayson that's relatively new that has a bunch of First Church people that are involved in it. They have uh, a mission to help uh, supply and meet the needs of foster uh, kids in our area and their families. They are having a grand opening October 14th at 1 p.m. That's on Friday. Their office is not too far away from the, uh, the post office. You go down that direction, directly across uh, from, uh, almost directly across from a barber shop down there. So they would love to invite anyone who would like to be a part of that. That's Friday, October 14th at 1 p.m. Um, also, Trunk or Treat, uh, the, the community has established the, trunk, the Trick or Treat Day, and that's Monday, October 31st. Uh, we're going to be having our Trunk or Treat here uh, that Monday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. We'd love for you to come, dress up, park your car, set up your trunk, pass out some candy, bring some candy with you. It's a great time uh, for us just to have some fun, uh, provide a safe place for the kids in our community and our church to tr trick or treat. And uh, I get to dress up. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the point for me anyhow. But that's October 31st, 6 to 8. Uh, November 4th and 5th, there's going to be like a, a ladies weekend here at church. Tammy Nashawn is going to be speaking. It's going to be a Friday evening. They're going to be do, doing dinner and then a service. And then kind of a brunch type, early lunch, 10.30ish. On Saturday, uh, they're going to be having some food, and Tammy's going to be speaking again. So, ladies, we'd love for you to come and, and make plans on being a part of that. Also, uh, those dates, that's the SCICOM weekend with the youth as well. So, youth in here, if you're interested in going to SCICOM, uh, please let Thomas know. Uh, but I, that's kind of what we have in the way of announcements, so I'm going to ask that you would one more time just to bow your head with me, and let's pray. God, we, uh, we are so thankful uh, for your presence here today. We're thankful for the worship. We're thankful for the word and the challenge that, uh, that we can find in um, just putting you first. God, we're so thankful that you desire us, uh, you draw us into your presence. And I pray that, uh, that we're more faithful with our desires and seeking you more. Father, I ask that as we go from this place, that God, that we would take the hope of the gospel and the resurrection of Jesus Christ with it, that we would share that with the people that we come in contact this week, and that you would work through us to make a difference in our community and in our families. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great day, guys. <laughs>